Um, so hello, I am Marissa Town. I am the clinical director for children with diabetes. I've lived with type one for 31 years. I'm a nurse and a diabetes educator. And it is my pleasure to introduce Svati, who is a journalist, a distance runner, and outdoor enthusiast with her dogs. Um, she was diagnosed with type one in, 2000, in the year, year 2000 at the age of nine. And she has written for the Atlantic, Courts, Outside Magazine, and the Washington Post. And she has been to CWD Friends for Life twice, including as a faculty member. So welcome, Svati. Thank you so much, Marissa. It's great to be here. Yeah, and if everybody that's uh, logged in, if you have questions that you think of throughout the chat, please feel free to type them into either the Q&A or the chat box. And um, I think Svati is going to share a slideshow first, and then we'll jump into q and I am going to share my slideshow in just a minute. Let me see if I can do, 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 do. nope, that's not it, sorry. PowerPoint, uh, I'm a little rusty on my PowerPoint here. That's what it is. Okay, <laughs> there we go. And how share my screen? No, it's not. Let me share my screen first and then click start slide. Don't <laughs> no worry. Okay. There it is. All right, view slideshow. Okay, so adventure travel and diabetes at Everest Base Camp. I have to. Uh, forewarn all of you that this is kind of an old story. Uh, these are events that took place six years ago now. I can't believe it's been six years. Um, but yeah, basically I got the opportunity uh, in 2015 to go work for a mountain climber who had a nonprofit group um, that was doing glacier research at Everest Base Camp. So he had climbed Everest several times. He was also doing this nonprofit work where he was taking photographs of the glaciers um, on Everest and he needed someone to basically be his assistant and like communications director for the expedition. So he invited me um, to go on this trip. And basically it was like an all expenses paid trip to Everest Base Camp. Um, and I had always wanted to trek to Everest Base Camp. You know, it's sort of, an adventure that I think is on a lot of people's bucket lists. It's something that anyone can do. You know, you fly into Nepal and it's a seven to 10 day hike to the base camp, but most people don't get to actually go in there and live at the base camp unless they're climbing Mount Everest. Um, so I was really thrilled to have the opportunity to do that. I had read a lot about Mount Everest. I thought mountain climbing was fascinating. Um, so I was really excited to do it. Um, of course, you know, the first thing that happened after I got the opportunity to go and when I was mulling it over was my mom called my doctor. She called my endocrinologist and he said, um, you know, there's no way to reliably measure your blood sugar up there at that altitude. And, you know, I just don't know that she'll be able to measure her blood sugars. And the trip plan had me going and living at base camp for a whole month. And so my mom sort of thought, okay, well, if she can't measure her blood sugars accurately for a month, that's the end of it. She's not going. So my mom called me and she said she'd spoken to my doctor uh, behind my back and said, you know, Spazi, I just don't think this will work. I, I don't think it's safe for you to go. And because through the children with diabetes community, we had met actually Will Cross, who I think was the first American man with diabetes to climb Mount Everest. And we had also met Sebastian Sasseville, who was the first Canadian with diabetes to climb Mount Everest. I knew that people with type one diabetes had gone and actually summited Everest. So I knew that it was possible to do, and I wasn't so quick to accept this verdict from my mom and my doctor being like, ah, you can't measure your blood sugars, it's not safe. I was like, I don't think that's quite true. You know, we know two guys who've done this. Um, I think we should, we should look at this again. And I really, really wanted to go. Um, the other thing was that I had been involved for a number of years with a nonprofit community um, uh, called Insulin Dependence. And though that was a group of type one diabetics who did Ironman triathlons and ran marathons and had sort of inspired me to do a triathlon for the first time. And um, one of their co-founders had trekked to Everest Base Camp before and he had type one diabetes. So I knew three different people with type one diabetes who'd been to Everest. Um, and I said to my mom, you know, like we have raised money for these organizations. We've participated in events with them. We tell everyone we meet that people with type one diabetes can do almost anything. 
you cannot shut me down from this trip. Like that's, you know, I basically said to my mom, like, don't be a hypocrite. <laughs> um, so then what we did was we actually called those guys up. We called Will and we called my friend Peter and we asked them for their advice. Um, and they gave me some really good advice that helped me feel more secure about going to this remote location where number one, I'd be at really high altitude and number two, there wasn't going to be um, any hospitals nearby. So um, these are the essential tools that I brought with me. Uh, it's funny, I was actually on the tandem T-Slim insulin pump at the time that I got this opportunity, um, but I was having a lot of occlusions with it and it was a pump that had to be charged. I'm actually on it now and I love it. Um, but something about charging the pump didn't feel right to me uh, going on the, what was basically gonna be an extended camping trip in the wilderness. I wanted an Animus because the Animus ran on a simple AA battery and you can you know, carry as many of those batteries with you as you want. And I just felt that it was gonna be more durable. So I actually got my doctor to help me switch insulin pumps. Um, and I got an extra one from a friend. <laughs> so I took two Animus insulin pumps with me and I had an old Deltec Cosmo insulin pump um, that I had worn years and years previously. Then I took my Dexcom G4 with me. Uh, I took a couple different glucose meters. I took um, three One Touch Ultra Minis and one One Touch Vario. And this was partly because my mom did all this research into how to test your blood sugar at high altitude and sort of concluded that the One Touch Vario was like the most accurate. And we all had also heard um, from I can't remember who it was that told us, but they said, you know, if you're unsure of your blood sugar, just test it as frequently as you can. And that way, and that way, sorry, I thought my mom, my mom's downstairs and I thought she was um, yelling at me. Oh, okay, yeah, my mom is yelling at me to say that it's Rick Philbin. Okay, mom, you all know Rick Philbin, apparently. Rick Philbin worked for Animus for years. And I guess Rick was the one, I don't think Rick was the one who told us this. But anyway, someone told us that you just test your blood sugar as often as you can. And that way you'll know if you get one reading that just doesn't seem right, you can just keep testing. So anyway, had a bunch of blood glucose meters. Here's a picture of my mom helping me pack all my diabetes supplies. And one of the research papers she looked at, you know, figuring out the effects of high altitude on blood glucose meter performance. Um, you can see there's like a picture of my diabetes packing list. Um, we had to get, uh, it was sort of like a team effort between my doctor and my insurance company to get like three months of supply, more than three months of supplies in advance. I don't know, we filled prescriptions for way more pump supplies and way more test strips than I normally would to take with me because I was going to be on a two month trip and I wanted to have three times as many as I needed of everything. So I guess I needed six months of supplies. Um, another thing that we did was made sure that I packed all of my diabetes supplies in different bags. So um, on the trek into base camp, you carry your own backpack most of the time, but then you have porters who carry duffel bags for you. Um, and then in addition to that, you also have some gear that's helicoptered up to base camp ahead of you. So I made sure that I put some of my diabetes supplies in the duffel bag that was helicoptered up to base camp. And then I put some diabetes supplies in the duffel bag that my porter carried each day. And then I put a lot of diabetes supplies in a bag that I carried each day because I knew that I had control over that bag. And if that bag was with me all the time, I had, you know, all the diabetes supplies that I needed with me and all, everything else in the other bags were just extras. That way, if anything happened, I wasn't going to be in deep trouble. Figuring out how to keep my insulin at the right temperature at high altitude um, was tough because Basically, when you're doing this trek, you start out, um, you know, at kind of a regular elevation in Nepal where it's not especially cold. It's really hot and dusty and sunny. And then eventually you get to Everest Base Camp where it gets really, really cold, but mostly at night. During the day, the sun is so powerful that uh, we actually had some like 60 degree days up there. So I wanted to make sure that my insulin wouldn't get too hot and also wouldn't get too cold. Um, I stored a lot of it in this 
little cooler thing. I also stored some of it in hydro flask water bottles um, that were insulated. And I stored some of it in like jacket pockets. I just had it all over the place. Um, I also used Frio packs. I don't know how many of you guys use the Frio, but the Frio is like um, a gel pack that you can get uh, wet and then it stays cold and keeps your insulin cold for like, I forget how many hours at a time but for a long time. Um, so that's one of my go-tos when I travel is using the Frio. We also got these little security blankets to like encase the insulin vials in so they wouldn't break if they were dropped. Um, and as you can see, I took way more insulin than I was going to need for two, I guess it was two and a half months was how long the trip was supposed to be. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so uh, making sure everything was gonna be charged was another concern. I had a lot of batteries uh, and a lot of chargers for everything. And then I actually slept with um, some of the batteries and some of my glucose meters in the foot of my sleeping bag at night to keep them warm. Um, I also brought a full supply of syringes and long acting insulin in case all three of my insulin pumps somehow broke. <laughs> um, I brought glucagon, of course, that's what's on the left here sticking out of a hydro flask. Um, but I also had a global rescue membership. So this was another thing that gave, you know, all of us peace of mind. And it's something that actually, um, I think all Everest climbers are required to have is a membership to a program like global rescue, where they will basically come and helicopter you out of the area in case there's an emergency. Um, there's some nuance to that. And, uh, you know, I, as you'll see in my story, I was not helicoptered out, even though there was a major disaster, but um, if you were to get really sick, they would come get you. Um, you know, this is just basic stuff. I had a lot of Gatorade powder with me um, to keep my electrolytes up and also to keep my blood sugar up on the track. The track was like a pretty serious physical thing. It was like six to eight hours of hiking each day for seven days. So that was something where I just had to worry about keeping my blood sugars up all day. Um, this is a picture of me in my New York apartment before I left. Um, I will say that I was worried about getting food poisoning in Nepal and I was worried about altitude sickness. And I'm someone who uh, often has stomach issues and gets sick and often needs to go to the hospital to get IV fluids because, um, because of my diabetes partly, you know, when you can't get anything down and your blood sugar is low, sometimes you just need like IV sugar to keep your blood sugar up and IV fluids to stop throwing up. Um, so I was really worried about getting sick in Nepal and not having a hospital to go to. I was worried about being at Everest Base Camp and letting my boss down by getting sick and having to be helicoptered out. I think that was my worst fear. Um, sure enough, I did end up getting sick and did have to go to a hospital, but this was in Kathmandu, Nepal. Um, so I did get food poisoning in Kathmandu. So um, Kathmandu is the capital of Nepal. You start your trip there. Um, it's a city, there's a good medical clinic. Uh, I got food poisoning, was in the hospital for about three days, getting IV fluids as usual. And my Dexcom at the time had the Dexcom share system set up. So my mom at home uh, in the US was tracking my blood sugars constantly, um, which I think she appreciated. And then I started my trek. Um, didn't really have any problems with that on the way up to base camp. Um, these were some sites. It was really, it was really great hiking, I will say, um, and really beautiful. Um, they had, you know, this was sort of uh, as much medical care as there was in the region. There was this little post um, for the Himalayan Rescue Association at this city called Ferriche. Uh, it wasn't even a city, it was a village sort of high up on your way to base camp. Um, learned some things there that sort of had a hand in me getting sick, but nothing to do with diabetes. Um, my Dexcom was really helpful during this trip. So uh, 
it didn't always work. You can see this picture on the bottom left. Um, sometimes, well, first of all, you can see that sometimes my blood sugar went really high. Um, and then sometimes the Dexcom just wouldn't give me any readings. Uh, so in order to sort of keep a log of what was going on, um, I had this field notes notebook where I wrote down every day what my blood sugars were and exactly what I was eating. Um, in hindsight, I don't really know how helpful that was, but at the time it gave me a sense of control, I guess. And it gave me a sense that I was like, um, doing everything I could do to take care of my diabetes. You know, sometimes, well, I don't know if this is true anymore, but when I first got diabetes, you know, back in 2000, I remember paper and pen log books just being huge and having to write down every blood sugar and every insulin dose and all those things. So doing that again, um, for this trip was sort of interesting. Um, this is just a note about the food that I was served at base camp and on the trip, you know, uh, I think sometimes people with diabetes, I've seen this on other trips that I've been on and I've experienced this myself, you get used to eating um, very particular foods because you know how they work with your blood sugar. And so traveling can be really hard when you don't know what kind of food you're going to have access to and like you can't pack you know, you can't pack your favorite breakfast and your favorite lunch and your favorite dinner with you for two months. Like, that's just not realistic. So you have to learn how to make do with what you're served. Um, and I really didn't know what we were going to eat every night. So I sort of found during the trek that this like garlic soup and this bread that they served at all the tea houses sort of worked for me. Like I figured out how to bolus for that. Um, but then at base camp, you know, sometimes we had watermelon for lunch, sometimes we had pancakes for breakfast, sometimes we had pasta, sometimes we just had soup, you know. Um, so that was tough to figure out and I sort of erred on the side of giving less insulin rather than too much insulin because I was really afraid of going low in the middle of the night. Um, this is a picture of the group that I was staying with at base camp. Um, this is a picture of my tent that I slept in. So I was embedded with um, the Everest ER. So the, there, there's this team of doctors that works at Everest Base Camp every year and they sort of provide medical care to all the climbers. Um, and I was part of their camp. So my tent was right above the Everest ER tent and it was really cool to like see how the doctors worked and also to sort of be at the center of base camp. Base camp is huge. It's like a mile long and there are probably a thousand or 1200 people living in it during an Everest climbing season. And the Everest ER really becomes a hub um, because the doctors are so well trusted and so valuable that everyone sends, you know, their climbers there for medical care, whether it's something really small, like the cold or something really big and life threatening. Um, so it was really cool to see so many people come through our camp uh, and get to meet lots of people from different countries that way. This is an article I wrote about what happened on April 25th, 2015. Um, basically, I was, uh, we were all, <laughs> sorry, we were all um, just having a regular day at base camp. I had been there for about two weeks. Uh, I got there in early April and sort of settled into life. And I was never going to climb Mount Everest. I was just there to support um, my boss's expedition. So I, that morning, um, had eaten breakfast and was drinking tea and like working on my laptop. We had Wi-Fi up there, which was cool. So I think, you know, I posted something on Facebook and then I was sending emails to people and I was in this tent writing emails and all of a sudden I felt the ground sway under me. And um, it was really confusing. Uh, and at first I thought maybe someone, you know, in the camp next to ours was like moving boulders or something. There were a lot of boulders and big rocks all around base camp. Um, and all the camps were always sort of moving things around. So at first I thought someone was like moving a boulder from one side of their camp to the next. Um, and then I realized it was an earthquake because once you stop and you think for 10 seconds, you can realize like, oh, the ground is really moving. This is what an earthquake feels like. Um, so then I stepped out of the tent and the other people that I was living with stepped out of their tents and we all sort of looked around. We all said earthquake. 
Um, and I, I asked, you know, earthquake, and I thought someone was going to teach me the Nepali word for earthquake, but no one did. Instead, we all looked around for avalanches. Um, and I, at the moment, actually thought that it was going to be pretty cool because we had heard a lot of avalanches in the night, uh, but I hadn't seen any big ones. And Everest Base Camp is sort of in this bowl, and there are a bunch of mountains on the sides. Um, and you know that avalanches come down those mountains, but they, they usually come down the sides of those mountains and they don't reach base camp. So as far as I knew, I didn't have anything to be scared of. Uh, I thought we would see an avalanche but not be affected by one, if that makes sense. Um, but instead what happened was we saw an avalanche forming and it was really, really big. It was on the side of it wasn't on the side of the mountain. It was sort of like the top of a mountain. <laughs> there was a mountain um, to the south of base camp called Mount Pumori, and there was a big ridge to the right of its summit, and it looked like the whole ridge was exploding. Um, so it looked like this giant, I mean, it was very, the way I described it afterwards, and the way I still uh, think of it in my mind is that it was very apocalyptic. You know, it just didn't see seem like anything I'd ever seen before or anything I had fathomed before. You know, I'd seen nature documentaries about avalanches and this didn't look like that. This looked like the whole mountain was exploding and rising up and coming at us in like a giant mountain tsunami. It was crazy um, and it was really scary. And I was like, oh, this is the end of the world. Like we're all gonna die. <laughs> Um, so we all turned and looked at each other and then we turned and we ran because you have to, the only thing to do is to run away from it. It was coming right at us. It was basically this whole mountain was just, um, coming and going to swallow up base camp. It looked like, so we ran, um, and we didn't get very far and, um, the blast hit us. It was this blast of snow that hit us. And I thought, okay, I'm in an avalanche. Um, and I couldn't see anything and snow was all around me and I was knocked down to my knees, but I tried really hard to stay upright because I kept thinking like, okay, well, you wanna, you wanna survive the avalanche. So try and stay upright and stay as close to the top of the snow as you can. So that way when you're buried, you're not buried too deep. Um, and I had seen nature documentaries again, like on National Geographic about avalanche survivors. And I remembered that if you keep a pocket in front of your face, you know, you can create some air so that you can keep breathing because I didn't want to suffocate under the snow. So that was kind of my uh, immediate priority. Um, and it went on for a little while. Um, and I just kept waiting to like black out. I thought I was going to black out and never wake up again. Um, but then it stopped. And I realized I was still alive and I was still awake. And I wasn't buried. It turned out that the snow, once it settled, it was really only up to my knees, uh, somewhere between my knees and my waist. And I was alive. Um, so then I looked around and I couldn't see anything or anybody. Um, and that was a really scary moment. Um, it seemed like the whole base camp had been wiped out. And there was just this moment where I thought that I was like the only one who had survived because <laughs> I didn't see anyone else. Um, but after a few seconds, other people started popping up out of the snow. And we all said, are you okay? Are you okay? And we said, yes, you're okay. And then we noticed that, that the Everest ER tent, the one that I showed you a picture of that had like the red cross on it, that was still standing. It was battered and sort of leaning over and blown open. There was a lot of snow in it, but it looked like it was still partially upright. So we walked over there um, and then the rest of the day was spent um, sort of helping with injured people. There were a lot of injured people, um, 18 or uh, numbers sort of vary on this, but between 18 and 20 people died. Um, this is a picture of what our tents looked like after we recovered them. So they had actually blown down past this ridge and uh, we recovered them a couple days later uh, in order to get some stuff out of them. And I got my diabetes supplies out of my tent. I had also had some diabetes supplies in another tent and that tent was swept away completely and was never recovered. So I lost probably less than a third of my diabetes supplies. I would say I had like 
I had one glucometer and one glucagon kit and a few pump supplies in that tent. So I didn't lose that much. Um, but we didn't have anywhere to sleep that night uh, in our camp. It turned out that um, another part of base camp had escaped totally unharmed from the avalanche. So the avalanche only hit half of base camp. So the other half of base camp was fine and they set up extra tents for people to sleep in uh, the first few nights after the event. So I luckily had some insulin in my pocket and I had my pump on me, my pump was fine and I had my Dexcom on me. And so I had everything I needed to at least get through the next 24 hours. Um, living in a different part of base camp. But when we came back to sort of salvage things, this was what our tents looked like. Um, this is just another picture of my stuff that I salvaged from my tent. Um, then eventually, uh, this was like a week later, I stayed with my boss at base camp. Um, at this point, all of the Everest climbing expeditions had been canceled and a lot of people had left, but we stayed to try and see if he could get pictures of what had happened. And we also stayed to help clean up some other camps that had really bad damage. Like this is one that's an example. Um, so they, uh, uh, six of their team members died during the avalanche and this was the state of their camp. So we stuck around and we helped, we helped them clean up. A lot of it was just trash collecting. Um, this is a picture of uh, a doctor I met who helped me um, when I when it was time for me to finally leave base camp. I had to walk out alone, and that was really scary. And he was a doctor for the Indian Army who said, "You know, I don't want you to go alone with your diabetes and without any IV IV equipment in case you need it." Because <laughs> I told him about how I often need IV fluids when I get sick. So he actually packed a kit of IV fluids. Um, and walked down with me to the first village that you stay at on your way out. Um, and this is a helicopter. I'm not sure why I have this picture here other than to say I did get to take a helicopter ride in the end back to Kathmandu. That was very exciting. Um, and that is sort of an abbreviated version of the whole story. <laughs> Um, I know I went through that kind of quickly, uh, and I'm sure I rambled as well, but it's been a long time since all this happened. So um, hopefully I'll be a little bit more articulate in answering questions. <laughs> so I have never heard you tell your story. Like I know your story, but I mean, wow, what a, I, I can, I just cannot even imagine being in that situation. Um, and, and like you said, I mean, I'm also one who tends to be um, air on the side of pukey and <laughs> need IV fluids. So um, I am so impressed that you, you were like, no, like I am not gonna let, you know, any of these barriers stop me from, from doing this. And, you know, I, I think my first question is, is how did you, how did you get that courage to, <laughs> to do this trek with diabetes, with the thought of, you know, getting ill and needing to get hospital care in Nepal or on the mountain? Yeah, I think a big part of it was knowing that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity and, you know, opportunities like this don't come around often. It's a very, very expensive trip to take on your own. Um, and the fact that someone was offering to pay my way was huge. And um, the fact that I had the global rescue insurance really helped knowing that like, okay, if worse came to worse, I could be helicoptered out. Um, so I was pretty confident with that. I was pretty confident that I wasn't going to die on the trip, you know, because I know how sometimes when you're really, really sick and you're puking your guts out, you feel like you might die. And like, in regular life at home in the US, like the thing that always fixes me is going to the hospital. So I was truly, truly scared about not being able to go to a hospital. Um, but then knowing that like, okay, I could be helicoptered to a hospital, I would be okay. Um, and then beyond that, knowing that other people with diabetes had done this, that was huge. And being able to talk to them and having them tell me, you know, like Spati, I did this five years ago when I didn't have a Dexcom and you have a Dexcom. And I was like, oh, you're right. My Dexcom is really helpful. Um, and also I think being a part of the diabetes community, especially being a part of the insulin dependence nonprofit where 
you know, I had for years in order to raise money for them, I had gone around telling people like, I don't let diabetes stop me from doing anything. I can do any, you know, I can do an Ironman, I can run marathons. So that had become part of my identity. Um, and I think that was what made it so important for me to like prove that I could do this. Yeah, I think it's funny because you mentioned, you know, your mom saying like, no, <laughs> like it's not safe. And I, I I hear often from people like like Will, like like Sebastian, Sebastian, like, you know, Nicole Johnson, who was Miss America. It's always like somebody told me no. And mm -hmm. I decided that I had to prove them wrong. And I think um, I think that's a common a common thread because we're told you know, so often living with diabetes, we're told, oh, this is going to be difficult. Oh, this is going to be harder, like, because you have diabetes. And, you know, it, it does, it becomes a, a part of us of, no, like, we can actually do this. Like, we're going to prove you wrong. Um, I want to ask, I have a, another question I just thought of. So what, what was the, what piece of advice did you get from the gents that have climbed Mount Everest that have type one? Like what was the thing that helped you the most? Oh, interesting. Um, I think what ended up being the most helpful was the advice to pack all of your diabetes supplies in different places. Yeah. Um, and the scenario that we used, and I think it was Seb who gave us this, he was like, you know, in case um, a yak pushes, you know, in case the yak that's carrying your duffel with all your diabetes supplies falls off a trail, you don't want to lose all your diabetes supplies in that one that one bag. So make sure you have them in multiple bags. Little did I know that instead of a yak falling off a cliff, it would be an avalanche sweeping half my di, you know, not half, but an avalanche coming through and sweeping some of my diabetes supplies away. That was really good advice that honestly made all the difference in that key moment, like, after the avalanche had first occurred and I was sort of getting my bearings and thinking about how to survive just the next 24 hours. You know, I know there was another diabetic on the mountain actually who was climbing Mount Everest that season and he was from a different country. But when it came time for people to be evacuated off the mountain, he apparently was really stressed out because he had lost some of his diabetes supplies in the avalanche. And he was like, I have to go, I have to go home right now. I can't stay here. Whereas I was in a position I'm sorry, my mom keeps coming. Mom, I was in a position where I could, I didn't have to leave right away. I didn't have to be evacuated. I didn't have to use that global rescue insurance. I had enough diabetes supplies with me to stay for an extra week and help other people clean up their camps. And that was just, that was really great. Yeah, I can't even yeah, begin to imagine. And I think, I know you mentioned you guys had to work with your insurance company to get the supplies. How easy or difficult was navigating that with your, with your healthcare team or with your insurance? So at the time, I had really, really great employer-sponsored health insurance. I don't know what it would look like today if I did this. But I, I think number one, I had a really, really great doctor. He's still my endocrinologist who just gets it when you need more, like when you need something a little bit non-traditional, he will happily write that script for you. So he really understood what I needed and was happy to help make it happen. Um, that goes too with like him arguing with the insurance company that I needed a new insulin pump, even though I had only had my tandem for a year. He was like, no, she needs to switch pumps and here's why. And like, this is medically necessary. Um, so that was really helpful. I also, my employer sponsored health insurance plan at the time, my co-pays for all my durable medical equipment were zero. Wow. Like, yeah, there was no copay. So that really helped. I don't know today if I could afford the copays for that much equipment up front. Right. Um, all the high deductible plans that we have. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if they, I don't know. I feel like insurance companies have cracked down on how much they let you do when you're traveling. I know they still, they all well, not they all, but mine still has certain provisions that will kick in if you tell them that you're traveling out of the country, then they'll make exceptions. So I think that helped. I don't remember it being a big problem or my biggest stressor at all, um, but certainly something that's a hassle to deal with. Yeah, and I agree with, I totally agree with what you're saying. I think it would be, it would be interesting to hear from someone that's trying to do it 
you know, now with the way insurance is and, you know, like you said, the way that people have sort of cracked down and, and even from the, you know, the insurance companies having like a preferred insulin pump and a preferred insulin, you know, it's, it's all gotten a, a little complex. Yeah. It's the nicest way to say that. <laughs> uh, so there is a question in the Q and A and um, so Don, and I think Don has been on a lot of our screenside chats. So thank you for the question, Don. He asked, um, you know, why, why do you end up having to go to the hospital? Because it sounds like you've had to go a few times and he has not, um, had this experience. So if you want to sort of, I know you start, you talked about it and I understand only because I also have mm -hmm. the stomach as you, it sounds like. <laughs> so. My mom is coming in here and saying, please mention CVS. So CVS stands for cyclic vomiting syndrome, which ah. is just such a lovely topic. Um, basically, it means that when I start throwing up, I really can't stop. So I will throw up like every 15 minutes forever and not forever and ever, thank God, but um, until I get some meds in me. So in addition to needing IV fluids, I often need um, IV Zofran or another anti-nausea medication that will just get me to stop throwing up. Um, which is really inconvenient. Um, and it's not a well-known condition. I think I've told a couple different doctors at a couple different ERs that I've had it. And sometimes they recognize it and sometimes they don't. Wow. And do you, so do you now, do you typically travel like with Zofran with you or things like that? And does okay. that ever help like head it off or is it it does. Yeah. So my endocrinologist, again, who's great, writes me a prescription for Zofran tablets and I carry those with me um, anytime I travel. And if I notice an episode, if I feel like an episode is about to come on, if I'm feeling nauseous, I just take a Zofran and that usually helps. So that's been great. Yeah. And do you think, I don't know if that is diabetes related. I have no idea, actually. I, yeah. My mom, my mom is piping in from downstairs to say, not necessarily. I don't think, I mean, I know it occurs in other people too. People with type yeah. one who have it. My mom says we've known people with type one who have it. I'm sorry. I'm just turning around to plug in my computer because the battery's low. Oh yeah. You're totally fine. Um, <laughs> so people, people who do throw up a lot should look it up though. Cyclic vomit. Yeah. I said cyclic vomit. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta love moms because you know they're just always looking out for us my it's mom if you can't tell is highly involved in my diabetes life <laughs> but you know there have been studies if it makes uh, this is just going to add fuel to her fire but there have been studies that show that the longer that parents are involved in um in young adults lives even with diabetes uh the better that we do really uh, yes and it's i think some of it is this is just something that's hard for us to bear the burden of all on our own and and just having someone else that you know can order your supplies for you or like fill your cartridge or reservoir like just like little things that they do um i think it makes a huge difference so i think it depends everybody's different and you have to navigate that relationship um you know, just like you do with any other relationship. <laughs> I certainly appreciated my mom's help getting all my supplies in order for this Everest trip. That was helpful. Yes. I can't even, even imagine. Um, I also, I, it was like so green for a while in your photos. So, oh yeah. In Nepal. Yeah. So I guess I don't, what I'm not understanding maybe is like, how long were you hiking where it was not snowing? Uh, like six days. Okay. It was like on our, well, yeah, let's see. The whole trek was eight days. And I think it was on our seventh morning of hiking that I woke up and there, there was like three feet of snow. Huh. Um, yeah. So, and that, at that point, our elevation was like 13,000 feet, maybe 14,000 feet. Yeah. So it was, it was dry and not snowy and warm for quite a while. Interesting. And then base camp is at what height? It's 17,500. Wow, which is, I think in the US, our highest mountain is like 15,000 almost. In the continental US, like yes. outside of Alaska. Um, I'm not sure, you shouldn't quote me on this, but it's not, okay. is it? I thought it was Pikes Peak, but I don't know. I feel like it's, I don't know, this is embarrassing. You know what, I don't know, I'm sorry, it's okay. So do you still, so, okay, so after all of this, do you, I guess, like, how has it affected you? Like, I mean, I think 
if you hadn't had an avalanche, you know, hit, I think your experience would have been obviously entirely different, but have you, do you still feel like, like you would do things like that again, or do you feel like you've been sort of like you've burned that bridge almost? I think diabetes wise, it's made me way more confident. And I feel like I can do like now I really feel like I can do anything with diabetes because that involved traveling to a relatively remote place, um, pushing my body, you know, to be at an altitude I had never been at before and uh, hiking longer than I've hiked and all these things. Um, so diabetes wise, I feel like I, I can take on any kind of trip. So that's a great feeling. Um, I will say that the avalanche experience itself was really, um, I don't know what the right word is. It really should, uh, yeah, like <laughs> jarring. It was very jarring. Um, and I had um, some PTSD for several months afterwards that I worked through in therapy. Um, and I think it, you know, it made me a little bit more brittle. Um, I would say I'm, I don't know if I'm quite as emotionally resilient uh, now as I was before that happened. It really, it, it was a, it was a tough one. Um, so, but that being said, would I go back? Absolutely. Would I do another high altitude trekking trip? Absolutely. Um, I feel like I have all the skills that I need to take on something like that. Yeah. And that's, and that's incredible. And I think, I mean, it's, I love that you had the insight to, you know, like this was a ridiculous experience. Like I'm going to seek mental health assistance because that is not something that most, most people experience in their lifetime and, and having, you know, the proper support that you need is, is really important. And I mean, even, you know, the normal stress of having diabetes is, is a lot for us to, to keep doing. Um, so I really appreciate you sharing that. Cause I think that's really an important part of the story. Um, so I guess I want to know too, cause I think so I often, which is silly, but like, you know, when you're on an airplane and you get like turbulence and I'm like, okay, where's my insulin? Do I have everything with me? Like, I like totally catastrophize, which is not great, but like how soon after you knew that you were okay in the avalanche, were you like, where's my insulin? Like, <laughs> Oh, good question. Um, gosh. Let's see. So, you know, there was probably a period of like five to 10 minutes where, I mean, I was in shock for longer than five to 10 minutes. I'm sure. Five to 10 minutes where I was just still absorbing the fact that I had survived. And there was a lot of snow in me. There was like snow in my underwear. My head had been hit by a rock. So my head was bleeding and it was like very disorienting. And I remember, you know, talking with this guy who was at the Everest ER, so, who I'd gotten to know very well. And we were both just holding each other's hands and crying. So, yeah. So that all went on for like 10, 10, 15 minutes. And then I really, really wanted to call my mom. I had my cell phone in my pocket oh. and I was really preoccupied with calling my mom to tell her what had happened. But you know, before she saw it on the news, but all the cell phone lines in Nepal were down. So that didn't work. Uh, and then I wanted to help people and so I was told to go, you know, get my sleeping bag and go get layers out of my tent. And so I think it was in that period of time when I was trying to go find my tent, which had been blown away, um, that it occurred to me, oh, my diabetes supplies are in my tent. Okay, how much insulin is in my pump right now? Okay, right. let me check my blood sugar and make sure I'm not low right now. Um, and then it was probably... I don't know. I think it might've been hours before I really had the presence of mind to think, okay, we're sleeping in another part of base camp tonight. Let me take insulin with me in case something happens. Let me take some pump supplies with me um, that I had dug out of my tent. You know, it was scary going to dig things out of my tent because it was like sort of over this hill. Um, let me, let me get just enough with me that I could get by for a few days you know, because at that point, I didn't know if I was going out on the helicopter the next day or, or what. Right. Um, but yeah, I will say it didn't come to mind immediately. <laughs> no, but that's, I mean, I think that's really interesting because I think, you know, it's hard to, you never know, like, how you're going to respond. And I think what an amazing 
like kind thing that you were like, okay, I'm fine. Now, what do I do to help? Like that is, <laughs> that's amazing, Swati. <laughs> Only certain people are like, I don't know, wired that way. And that's, I mean, that's incredible. I think I would hope that I would feel the same way, but I have no idea. <laughs> I was also a total chicken in a lot of ways. So I wasn't, oh, sure. you know, I mean, and I didn't end up being that helpful. I, I wanted to give like some of my jackets and I, I did give my sleeping bag to someone. Um, but the doctors at the Everest ER were like, no, you take care of yourself. Like you don't need this. You like, you don't need to help anyone. Like just put that jacket on yourself. And I was like, who can I give this jacket to? They're like, put it on and sit down. <laughs> <laughs> and I did as I was told. So I wasn't, I wasn't that helpful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, it, that's interesting. How long, so the doctors that go up there, are they there for like a long time or like just like one season or? Just the season. So the Everest climbing season is generally from like the end of March to the end of May um, with a little bit of wiggle room on both sides, but generally um, teams of climbers arrive at the end of March, beginning of April and then people start reaching the summit of Everest in May. It really varies. Sometimes it's the beginning of May, sometimes it's the end of May. Um, and generally after they've summited, they leave base camp. No one sticks around base camp for long after they've had a successful expedition. Um, so generally it's all emptied out by early June. Um, and that's how long the Everest DR team is usually there. Okay, interesting. And you, like, you were already pretty physically active. So, and have you also run marathons? I, you're a runner, but could you give me a little more details? Sure. So I have run, now I've run three marathons and I've also done an ultra marathon. I did one 50K race a couple years ago. Um, at the time that I took this trip, I think I'd run two I'd run two marathons and then I ran a bunch of half marathons and just like ran regularly in New York City to, to stay in shape. And I went to the gym, in New York City, you know, things like that. And I'd been on a couple of backpacking trips uh, with insulin dependence. I mean, I really credit the diabetes community with giving me a lot of my outdoor experience, which is great. Yeah, I think it also helps just to have that sort of camaraderie and that you know, you, you know what people have done, you know what you can do. And, but I think, you know, it seems, you know, when you do these things, you see, oh man, I can totally do this. And then you get more confidence to do more and more. Mm -hmm. I've never heard of an ultra marathon. That sounds like, like torture, honestly, <laughs> but you're incredible. <laughs> um, oh, I wanted to ask about ketones. Did yeah. you, did you take stuff to measure your ketones with? Did you find that you experienced more ketones than normal or how that I goes? took ketone testing strips. I've never been good about testing for ketones. My mom will tell you that, you know, whenever I'm sick, my mom was like, are you testing for ketones? And I'm like, I don't have ketones. Cause I also like a thing that I've noticed about my body is I, I can hardly remember a time I've ever had ketones. I think I've had ketones like once in my life that I can remember. Um, so it just doesn't happen that often. So a lot of times I don't bother testing for them. So I'm like, I don't have ketones, but I took ketone testing strips with me. I think I took three, three vials of those and kept those in different places. And um, also I think, I can't remember if one of my glucometers had the ability to test for ketones in the blood or not, but that might've been a thing. Um, I didn't test for ketone. I did test for ketones when I was sick in the hospital at the beginning of the trip and I didn't have them. And then the rest of the trip, I never needed to use them. So that's just never been a big concern in my diabetes management, fortunately. Yeah, that's lucky. I think, I, yeah, I, I don't, I feel like some people are like really prone to getting ketones and like going into ketosis and like some people are not. And I don't know, um, you know, I don't know if we know why that is, mm. but, um, but that's my experience too. Um, and then, okay, so you are a journalist. Yeah. And I wanted to ask a couple of questions about that, if that's okay. Sure. I mean, it's <laughs> related, but so, you know, diabetes, you never wanted it to hold you back from anything, right? And so when you pursued the, the career of being a journalist, um, you know, how did diabetes play into the way that you went about, you know, pursuing that career? Because having insurance, you know, like we talked about is yeah. hugely important. Yeah, I would say it's played a huge role in every job decision I've made. And I think 
you know, especially in journalism, a common path that a lot of people take is to work on staff somewhere for a few years, whether you're a magazine journalist or a newspaper journalist or a television journalist, um, maybe less so in television. I don't know that much about TV journalism. I'm more of a magazine and newspaper and digital journalist. Um, but you'll be on staff somewhere for a couple of years and then you decide to go freelance. Freelancing is really common. I know a lot of people who just are complete freelancers and they make their livings that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm pretty sure that's never going to be an option for me. I've thought about it a couple of times, but I just don't see a way to not have employer sponsored health insurance. Um, even with, you know, Obamacare now or the Affordable Care Act. Um, and the insurance plans you can get through the states. You know, I, I looked recently uh, at state-sponsored plans because I was thinking of, of taking a contract job. Um, and yeah, just the cost of your pump supplies, it's astronomical. I mean, I just haven't. So uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna be on staff for a long time. Um, that has affected my career substantially, I would say. I think I am definitely in a place where I want to have job security and job security is not easy to find in journalism. A lot of the most exciting jobs in journalism do not come with job security. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I would say, I feel like diabetes holds me back a little bit in, in my career in that way. Yeah, certainly it has nothing to do with how long I can sit at a desk or how well I can write a story, but um, I think it, it definitely affects the career choices I've made. Yeah, yeah, because you have to make decisions that, you know, are, are smart and, you know, when we, when we don't have guaranteed health care um, and, you know, I'm, so I recently am on the ACA now and mm -hmm. I haven't ordered my pump supplies yet, so I can't give you any feedback. Um, but so far, I mean, I went to the doctor and it was like, it's going to be $250 out of pocket. And I'm like, I don't really understand, but it's fine. It's fine. Like I'll pay it. It's just, you know, it, it's, it's definitely not the ideal. It's not, it's not those situations where you have no copay and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> um, which I was spoiled with in California because I had um, Stanford insurance and it was Kaiser and mm. it was like a patient medical home. Um, I thought they were going to like come after me because they gave me insulin for free. And I was like, just like run, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but it is, it's an unfortunate, like an unfortunate thing that we, you know, in, in the U S sort of have to navigate. Um, and hopefully that will change. Um, and I wanted to ask like another sort of couple questions. Um, when you were with your team, at Everest. Did you tell, I'm presuming you told everyone that you have diabetes. I did. And what sort of training did you give them? Interesting question, because generally, whenever I go on a backpacking trip, or even I remember when I went to running camp in high school, or, you know, when I had to go to sleepovers in high school or mm -hmm. whatever, or now, whenever I go on any sort of trip with people or when I'm dating someone, you know, I give them the spiel about glucagon. I'm like, this is my red glucagon kit. I keep it here. If I pass out from low blood sugar, this is what you do with it. And I always give them a little tutorial. I think I gave the doc, I didn't give everyone. Let's see, I had um, a Sherpa who guided me on my trek to base camp and I told him where it was nice. um, and how to use it. And then probably half of my teammates at base camp, all the doctors knew where it was and how to use it. Mm -hmm. um, my boss knew where it was and how to use it. Um, but I didn't tell like all of, we had a lot of Sherpa support staff um, and some of them only spoke Nepali and I, I didn't know how to communicate with them. And right. I didn't feel like that was a fair burden to put on them also to look out for me. Yeah. That well, so, that would be really hard to explain if you don't speak the language because it's complicated. Yeah. <laughs> so I felt like as long as at least, you know, half the people who were there, we were all always there, you know, up in each other's space all the time. So I felt really safe um, educating them about glucagon. And it was really, what else? I mean, I talked to the doctors a fair bit about general diabetes stuff, like about my carb counting at dinner. Um, they would ask me questions. I mean, it's great when you're around people who proactively ask questions and you can just right. be open and answer them. 
because I feel like people learn the most that way when they see you doing something on your pump and they're like, oh, you know, are you giving yourself insulin for dinner? How do you decide how, like, do you give yourself the same amount every night? And I'm like, no, I don't give myself the same amount every night. Like, this is what I'm, this is the reasoning, you know? And then you sort of get into intricacies of diabetes more. And I feel like then they learn all these other things. Yeah, you probably changed the way those doctors treat diabetes, um, you know, honestly. Um, yeah, that's really, it's, I'm glad that, you know, now we have like the nasal one, but, and then there's the other, like the easy injectors. Cause again, you know, just like the, just like Will and Seb said to you, like, you've got the Dexcom, we didn't have that. You know, now we have better glucagons that are at least, you know, relatively easy. Like I've sort of trained my seven-year-old how to do the nasal one, just in case, I mean, I also said, just call 911 because, you know, yeah. he's love it. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, knock on wood, fortunately, I've never, yeah, had this. Same. I know. Um, yeah. And then, um, so you talked about how you kept your insulin from freezing, but I wanted to just ask a little bit more about that. Cause that's one of the things, you know, that's the, the most, you know, temperature sensitive, um, how did it, when it was in that cooler, how mm -hmm. did it stay warm when you were at the, like the low temp? I guess how, I don't know how low the temperatures get at base camp. Um, I want to say it got to like zero degrees at night. I don't remember being much colder than zero degrees. It might've been a couple degrees below. Um, but I kept that cooler at the foot of my sleeping bag. And okay. so it was all toasty with me in my sleeping bag. And then during the day, my tent actually got really warm. So yeah. during the day, I had to make sure that it didn't get too hot. But at night, I just slept with it under my warm feet. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, yeah, just keeping all your little yeah. thing, insulin by your body. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> um, we are almost finished. So I wanted to ask, lastly, what advice would you give to someone that wants to do the same trek that that you did that has diabetes? I think uh, harness the resources of the diabetes community, check around, you know, find someone like me or other people. I know I'm not the only person with diabetes who's done this, you know. Um, so find someone with diabetes who has been to high altitude, has done the exact trek, can tell you about the food, can tell you about you know, how they adjusted their basal rates on their pump during the high, just because even if, even if you're not going to do the same thing, because we're all so different, we all have really different diabetes management strategies. I think just hearing about someone else's mental approach can take a big load off um, when you learn about how someone else had to think through problem solving with their diabetes in a certain situation, knowing that then you can be in the same situation and you can problem solve your way through it too um really helps and yeah I mean my advice would be also if you know your mom and your doctor first tell you that you shouldn't do it get a second opinion make them reconsider <laughs> you know and it's not just I think sometimes like it's also okay if you decide that you're not comfortable doing something like this because you have diabetes like that's fair I think we all have different comfort levels and I think there are certain things in, that I'm never going to do in this world because I'm not comfortable doing them. And like, you don't have to prove anything to anyone other than yourself. So like, if you are not comfortable taking your diabetes on an adventure in the wild or, you know, whatever it is, like I would never go to space, even if diabetics can go to space one day, which, you know, I, I bet one day NASA will, will have someone who really wants to right. be an astronaut who's a diabetic, like not for me. Um, I agree until so, I have to go. <laughs> so just don't put too much pressure on yourself uh, either way, but know that like our community is here for you and there are people who would love to give you advice and love to support you uh, if you do take on any kind of adventure like this. I think that is just a beautiful way to to end the chat because I think, you know, most of us that are on here and that, you know, log into CWD and other diabetes communities online, we we know how important it is to, to have connections with other people with diabetes because whether we like it or not, our lives are just, they're a little bit different. And um, like you said, everyone's different and it's very nuanced and, and having people that really understand what you're going through can be tremendously helpful. 
So thank you really from the bottom of my heart. Also, it's so nice to see you after such a long time. I hope I get to see you soon. And I hope that, you know, insurance changes and you can figure out a way to freelance so that you can pursue your dreams. Uh, um, and thank you everybody who logged in and please check out cwd.is backslash community for more uh, future screenside chats and other diabetes events. Thanks, Marissa. Bye. Thanks, Fatih.